or in listen only mode. Well, hello, it's the 24th of November, and uh, we've got a lot to get through on this day today, Thursday, um, with uh, our usual update on the global share portfolio. Thanks for joining us as always. Um, we've got a few changes, so I'm not going to uh, and spend too much time on looking at the existing members of the portfolio, but uh, as we like to finish these uh, conversations in half an hour, um, I'm going to be spending more time on the changes that we're making to the portfolio this month. As always, Stuart uh, Lohman, our managing editor, is with us in um, Johannesburg. Stuart, you'll be following and looking out for questions. Yes, thanks, Alex. Always good to be here. Um, yeah, always try to keep it interactive, and the question box on the right hand side, just pop them in there, and we'll get to them as soon as possible. So, yeah, as per usual. So as the questions come, you stop me and uh, and we then address the individual bits. So if there's anything in the portfolio or anything in the presentation that is bothering you that you're not 100% sure with, please stop us and uh, send those questions in and we'll get right to them. All right, well, let's get straight to the portfolio itself now. And um, hmm. I'll get on to the first page as just as soon as I can get this uh, thing to work a little bit more efficiently. My apologies. Uh, for some reason, we, there we go. Okay, that's a little bit better. Right, uh, it shows you that we've got quite a few transactions uh, that we're going to be doing today, and I'll, I'd like to take you through all of them. Your PowerPoint's not being shared. Okay, all right. Well, let me just, while we, <clears throat> while we get that all sorted out, um, just to bring you back to the the whole idea of the portfolio. We are in a, um, the whole idea about this is that we actually, aha, uh -huh, there we go. Stuart, is that better? Uh, yeah, perfect. You got it, okay, yeah. my apologies for that. Um, the idea here is that we started it off two years ago. The decision then was to take a view on South Africa's economic policies which we believed were going in the wrong direction. As a consequence of that, the impact was going to be a weaker rand over time, and as a result, it was an uh, incentive to start looking internationally for the opportunities that existed in international markets. Now, this is not something new. Uh, quite a few people have been investing offshore. What our problem was as consumers or as retail investors was that there was no real easy way of doing this. Standard Bank brought in Web Trader, which completely changes all of that, and up to a million rand that is invested into Web Trader can uh, be allocated to this portfolio without having to ask any questions or even tax clearances, etc., because that is part of the whole process of exchange control relaxation in South Africa. So this was the idea. Take a million rand, or if you can, uh, we started off with uh, two hundred thousand dollars. It's a couple of years ago, um, and then allocate this according to the weightings that we have in our portfolio. We'll get into it in a second, but just to let you know that in this past month, I came across a, a company called Metro Bank here in uh, London, and we've bought some of those into the portfolio in this quarter. The way we do it is that we do not buy everything. When we find a new stock to invest in, we do not make that investment immediately. We try to take out the impact of the RAND and the impact of share price movements because this is a long-term portfolio. It's done un unbelievably well in the last two years, but it has been structured on the basis of being a long-term portfolio, so you won't chop and change the holdings at all. We have, however, over the two years, sold one stock out of the portfolio, and that is the um, insulin producer Novo Nordisk, which had done terribly well to begin with, and then it really hit bad times. They got rid of their chief executive, who incidentally had just won an award from the Harvard Business Review as being the best chief executive in the world, so it just shows, watch out for hubris. Uh, they also started moving into the United States, where there is a dramatic imp uh, improvement in the pricing of pharmaceutical products for consumers, but of course that doesn't work very well for, com for companies who are busy there. And all round Novo was starting to go on the back foot. They'd had a fantastic run. They really did 
um, poorly in the in the couple of quarters. We watched them. We then decided to sell out of them, and thank goodness that happened because a month ago when we sold out of Novo Nordisk, it was only a few days later that they came out with a profit warning, a warning and the share price has really tanked subsequent to that. We're out of Novo Nordisk, but what we've also done was when we structured the portfolio initially, around a third of the portfolio was put into the Vanguard S&P 500 index tracker in the United States. That was to give the portfolio some ballast. It was also to give us an opportunity, if we found new stocks that we'd like to invest in, to reduce that holding and then to reinvest that money into the stock selections that we found. Last month, we did exactly that. We sold Novo Nordisk. We took the cash that was in uh, there and allocated that to Facebook and Tesla. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a moment. And this month, we are now take, we are selling a, a half of the Vanguard holding that we had and we're buying into Metrobank. The idea here is to slowly do the purchases. So you don't sell and then buy immediately. You buy over three months. So you, you'll see what we're looking at there is that today we've bought another 55 Facebook. It was at last night's closing price. Another 18 Tesla. Uh, those That is the second leg of the purchases that we're doing with those stocks. So next month we'll buy another 55 Facebook, another 18 Tesla, and then we've done our deals on that one. Next month we'll buy another 157 Metro Banks, and the following month in January, the final 157 Metro Banks. I hope that's all pretty clear, the way that we do this. It takes out of the equation the risk of uh, exchange, uh, exchange rate changes and the risk of share price changes as well. Because remember, these are long-term shareholdings that we're having in these individual stocks. Moving on then to the portfolio itself. And this is uh, it gives you a breakdown of the portfolio. It's a little bit... Um, uh, it's getting complicated, more and more complicated all the time um, because of the number of holdings that we have, but we are trying to keep it as simple as possible. If we start off by going to the far right hand side where it says the target, there you will see that Alphabet has a target holding of 16% and Apple a target holding of 16% as well. On those two, Alphabet has clearly outperformed this portfolio and you can see the, the shareholding uh, of the portfolio is 18% there, Apple has underperformed and that's a shareholding of 12% uh, of the overall portfolio. We then still have 12% of the portfolio as a target for Vanguard, um, which is the, if you like, the money that we're keeping in the market, but as soon as we find another stock, stock pick or something that jumps out as a, at us, we can buy into that one as well. We will sell the, the index tracker. But overall, when you look at this, at a glance, you can see that the return of this portfolio over two years has been 25%. Uh, that compares with the market overall over two years of 7%. So it's con comfortably outperformed the market. Um, primarily on this, uh, in this past month, we've had some quite big changes. And uh, it was not surprising because Donald Trump got, uh, got elected in the United States. The impact of Donald Trump's election overall has been perceived anyway as a blow to Silicon Valley. So we've had declines in the past month in the share prices of Alphabet, Amazon, and Apple that are in our portfolio. Alphabet down from $813 to $760, which lost about $3,000 for us in our portfolio. Amazon was down by eight, from $838 to $780. That lost us also about $3,000. And Apple was down from 117 and a half to 111. That took about $2,000 off the portfolio's value. On the other hand, Trump's election has been seen as very good indeed for the old industry stocks. And we saw a move upwards, a uh, very sharp move upwards by Berkshire Hathaway, which went from $144 to $158. So that added about a $1,500 to the portfolio. And IBM, which put on 10 dollars in its share price, adding another thousand dollars to the portfolio. It was also a seen or perceived to be a very good thing for banks and banks around the world have, um, well they call it a rotation back into financial, into the financial sector. The reason for that is that Trump wants banks to start lending again. So they are going to have a look at legislation that was brought in after the great financial crisis to make banks 
um, more highly regulated. Uh, Trump believes and his advisors say that that has stopped banks from lending. They want banks to lend again, so they're going to ease off on those regulations on banks. And the immediate impact of that was that Barclays Bank, which we bought, sadly, just before Brexit on the 29th of April. Remember, Brexit was on the 23rd of June. Um, as immediately after Brexit, Barclays Bank tanked. Uh, now it has been surging, and in fact, Barclays Bank is in front for us finally uh, after holding on to it for a while. So it's a very good idea not to start trading in stocks. Had we done that, we would have taken an awful hiding on Barclays Bank. Now it is, uh, in fact, 6% above the level that we bought it at, uh, and despite the decline in the pound. So it shows you exactly what happens. This is uh, Barclays, of course, you buy in pounds, but we convert it into US dollars. Uh, if you see that the dollar value on this table is about $18,500 from around $17,500. The other bit of good news here was that our staggered purchase philosophy has worked really well with both Facebook and Tesla, both of those stocks having declined in the past month. So we only bought the first, quarter, uh, first third last month. Then we had Trump elected. We have both share prices falling. We've now been able to buy in more cheaply um, or rather to, to get even better value from those stocks in this uh, past period. There you have the overall look uh, when you convert it into rands because remember this is a portfolio that was structured for South African investors and the annualized return of the portfolio is 30% largely because in the last month as you when you have a look down the bottom you can see the rand has gone from 1379 pre-Trump election to 1423 post-Trump and that has a, a lifting effect on the portfolio overall. At the moment, um, you, we don't really concentrate until we've bought our full allocation on uh, new stocks. So Facebook and Tesla is not really uh, worth looking at at the moment uh, in, the, in the context of their share price movements. But when you look elsewhere, you'll see there's been, in RAND terms, some very hefty appreciations. Of course, the star of the show, Amazon, which is up 200% in RAND terms. That's the kind of uh, investment that can change your address and certainly has contributed very significantly to the performance of this portfolio. But also good uh, RAND performances by pretty much everything, even the market as a whole, the Vanguard, uh, which is up by 36% in RAND since we bought it first time, uh, since we started the portfolio, which was in December 2014. So moving on to the individual performances of the stocks. As you can see, when we started in 2014, the RAND was 11.27, it's now 14.23, so the RAND has depreciated by 26% or annualized 14%. That's had a, the, the effect of supporting our original idea, which was to find a RAND hedge, and it certainly has uh, given anybody, I guess, who invested rather than traded in Web Trader, the Standard Bank product, uh, a, a good return. You, you would have had to have made some pretty sad investments to to have lost all of that RAND depreciation. And on the other hand, we've been pretty fortunate with Amazon and Alphabet, two of the top performers on the U.S. market, in fact, two of the top four uh, on the U.S. market in 2015. They talk about the FANGs, which is Facebook, app, uh, am, uh, Facebook Amazon, uh, Netflix, and Google. Google is, of course, called Alphabet today, and to have two of those fangs, which were the primary reason why the S&P 500 lifted last year, uh, has been pretty fortunate for us in our portfolio. Berkshire Hathaway is now starting to look pretty solid, uh, moved up well in the past month. IBM is doing nicely, and uh, quite a relief to see Barclays breaking into profit after losing so much uh, straight after Brexit. And there it is, there's the, the um, pictorial uh, reflection, as you can see on the far left-hand side, the RAND dollar, which has helped, but uh, by having the huge outperformance from both Amazon and, to a lesser extent, Alphabet, uh, even Vanguard uh, outperforming the RAND, that has made a, a significant difference to uh, our portfolio's performance. Also, we do take into account dividend receipts. In this past quarter, there were, uh, sorry, this past month, there were uh, dividends paid by IBM and Apple. Uh, both the good, healthy dividends, $1.40 by IBM. It's only $140, but when you um, add them all up, it comes to about $5,000 that we've added to the portfolio over the past two years through dividends. 
I wanted to spend more time on our newcomer to the portfolio, and here it is. Um, Stuart, before we go, are there any questions that we need to address? Uh, not at the moment, Alex. Very quiet on the Q&A front. Sorry. Quiet Q&A front. Okay, so we clearly are. Uh, that, that's really much of the background. Let's get into the specifics. And this is a, uh, a tip, if you like, that I was given by none other than Kheri Fouri. Kheri Fouri is the chief executive of Capitech. Now, if you had bought Capitech, if you'd put a thousand rand into Capitech after they lift, listed on the JSC, today that thousand rand would be worth 65,000 rand. So they've got something going for them, something very big going for them. And by the way, it took a while for Capitech to, for the share price to start lifting. So we're not going back to the initial stages and saying, uh, using an, an artificially low share price. It is, they've had a 52% gain uh, annualized compound in their share price since they listed on the JSC. And um, that tells you that they've got a business model that works. So I said to Kheri, why didn't you guys, I saw him uh, in the last month, why don't you guys make an investment here, come into the UK and bring your incredible model, which is simple banking, um, re reducing the number of products, focusing on the retail market, and, and just making it easy, getting your money through transaction-based revenues, what, it, what discovery has brought to the world in, in something called the shared value model. So if, if Capitech can save you money, then you're quite happy to give it a share of the money that you're saving. That's what discovery does with its whole health strategy. And he said, have you heard of Metro Bank? I hadn't. Um, I'd seen them around and, and having walked past them, thought, well, maybe it was a, a spin-off because they've got similar colors to the German, I think it is, retailer, certainly a continental retailer, which is a bit down market of those of you who have been into metros in continental Europe. But when I started looking into it, my goodness, was this a jewel uh, that has been uncovered here. Metro is an, is an incredibly interesting company. It was started by a gentleman who did the same thing in the United States with a company there called Commerce Bank. What he did was he, he uh, created Commerce um, Commerce Bank One, it's called, in the US in uh, the early 1980s when he was a young man uh, in his in his 20s, and he then built this company up. Uh, his name is Vernon Hill, incidentally. He built this company up by focusing on exactly the stuff that Capitec does in South Africa. He sold it for eight and a half billion dollars after starting with nothing. He got to 400 branches. And for the rest, uh, for all intents and purposes, uh, Mr. Vernon Hill then decided to retire until he saw that the UK offered as good an opportunity as he'd uh, found in, um, in the United States with, uh, with Commerce Bank One, incidentally, which was bought and then absorbed into another company. So it doesn't exist anymore in its original form. He then started with a branch, one branch at Hoburn, in the uh, center of London, that is five years ago. And subsequent to that, the 44th branch was opened in Clapham Junction. But what is exciting, particularly exciting about this company, is that we know, we've seen the Capitec story from a South African perspective. And if you look at the numbers that Metro Bank produces, it is Capitec Mark II. Sure, there's only 44 branches, and uh, Capitec is, of course, a multiple of that, 10 times that. but Metro Bank has got a huge amount of runway uh, ahead of it, and having lived in the UK now for six months and had a look at the way the high street banks operate, there is much room for improvement. They've got a lot of legacy. The banks here have been hammered by the regulator for mis-selling of products. They've had to pay huge fines. A consequence of that has been that the staff have not seen increases, much less bonuses, for quite some time. On top of that, staff have been uh, the staff numbers have been contracted. Um, only recently did I see a little bit of, an, uh, of a glimmer of hope in Barclays, which seemed to be really refocusing on their retail uh, operations. And when you walk into Barclays branches through the new CEO and the new uh, chairman, you almost get a bit of an uplift. But when you go elsewhere, you meet people who are very unhappy, very gloomy. They are demotivated. They're only working at that bank because they have to, because all these huge fines, you can imagine, has taken money away from 
the uh, the bank's ability to reward its staff, particularly at the retail level, and is that through the consolidation that we've seen and the contraction of the staff uh, numbers, the service to customers has not been good. And he, along comes Metro Bank with a whole new offering, uh, much better, much keener uh, pricing, just like Capitec in South Africa, and they've just broken into profit for the first time, that was in the quarter to um, the end of September, where they showed a small profit of uh, 600,000 pounds, but the growth is Capitec-like. This is a company that is, uh, its deposits are growing 66% year on year, revenues up 78% year on year, assets 66% year on year, and uh, they are run along the same lines. They call the branches, not branches like banks do, but stores. Uh, I'm sure they also find their staff from the retail sector or um, that kind of approach where they are selling products to people who are walking in, not uh, like your traditional banker who wants you to only address him once you've got up off your knees. I'm joking about that one, of course, but uh, I think you get the picture. It is a company that has, the share price has declined uh, through Brexit, which was really a crazy thing to have happened given the structure of this UK Capitec. Um, as you can see on the, on the chart that's up on the screen now, it dropped significantly on uh, Brexit, which is on the 23rd of June with huge volumes, uh, and since then has just been going one way, as people once again uh, understand that this is a business that has got a very unusual business model, a disruptive model which does work. They've now got uh, 848,000 customer accounts, up by 68,000 in the past quarter. Now, when you look at this graph, you say to yourself, what the heck are we doing buying in after there's been such a huge improvement in the share price over the, well, since listed, it only listed in April this year, but over the past uh, few months, particularly post-Brexit. My thinking on this is that if you have a look at Capitec's share price at, the, at a similar stage, you would also have been scratching your head and saying, isn't this stock too expensive? Um, but as you have held on to Capitec over the years, you've seen that any bank that can grow its, its base at these kind of numbers uh, justifies its rating and then more some. So I'm a, a very bullish on Metro Bank. We've bought our first third. We're going to put 8% of the portfolio into the stock. We've bought our first third this month. We're going to buy another third next month. And the final third will be bought in January. So I'd suggest that when you do your purchases, you do it the same way as well. We don't know what's going to happen in the next week, let alone the next month, certainly the next two months. You try and take out of the equation as much as possible. Try and take out the problem or the, 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 the issue of timing. So let's um, uh, have a look. Stuart, any questions yet? Alex, okay, so I've got a question from Jessica. She says, I've got a 10,000 pounds at the moment, and I understand this is probably the minimum I should invest from a cost efficiency perspective. Which stock should be my priority starting point if I want to take a lead from the BN portfolio? I would uh, say, Jessica, that the, the best way to do it is actually just to follow our, if you can, allocate that, if you were to allocate that 10,000 pounds across the whole portfolio, you probably, so that's, mm, what are you talking about, 200,000 Rand. Um, or 180,000 rand. You you probably got enough there to be able to buy the individual or to replicate the exact portfolio as we have it. I would really suggest that you do that. Um, and when you you make those decisions, and you, you, this this webinar will be republished on Business News, you'll be able to go on there, have a look, freeze frame if you like the um, the portfolio itself, and make your allocations accordingly. The whole idea of the monthly uh, update is that we can tell you about the portfolio in a whole. And we look at this portfolio holistically, not as individual stocks. You're not here trying to buy, pick, and, uh, pick the, the eyes out of it. We would really recommend that you buy the whole portfolio as it is because this is the way that it gives you a balance. So I hope, I hope that helps you, Jessica. Looking back at Metro, though, um, I'm... Uh, hope you understand the case that we've now made for it and indeed that it is one that you will be making your little allocation to um, in the next few hours 
to try and replicate or, or make your portfolio look as close as possible to the one that we talk about every month. The S&P 500 has been an interesting performer in the past month. You can see from the share price there, remember we have um, around 10% of the portfolio in this index tracker. Uh, the market loved Donald Trump's decision to, or rather Donald, Donald Trump's um, prognostications about what he wants to do with the economy, that he wants to grow the uh, infrastructure, that he wants to get banks lending again, wants to make America great. Well, at the moment it's lots of talk, um, but the market is still giving him the benefit of the doubt, and as you can see, the S&P 500 adjusted upwards slightly in the past month. Alphabet, on the other hand, being a Silicon Valley stock, did not adjust upwards. In fact, it went down quite sharply. And there were a couple of reasons for this. Um, if you see the whipsawing in the share price there towards the end, um, where it was above 800, came down below seven, about 760, and then went back towards 800 again, that is all Mr. Market at work. The Alphabet share, uh, share price improved when the third quarter results were released. It showed net income up 27%, better than was anticipated uh, by, the, the, um, by the traders. Um, it pushed, it was up, uh, incidentally, primarily driven there by Google. Remember, Google is the, is the biggest holding in Alphabet. Um, the revenues, around $5 billion for the quarter versus $4 billion a, uh, for the same quarter a year before. The company exceeded all expectations. Um, the market was looking for about $8.60 as an estimate for its earnings, and Google came out, or Alphabet rather, came out at around $9. Much of the uh, uptick there was also, as before, given to the very impressive Ruth Porritt. Ruth is an ex-Morgan Stanley investment banker who took over as the financial director of Google in May 2015 and has been able to claw back on um, quite a few of the costs that this tech uh, focused company was was uh, it seemed to be getting the costs seemed to be running away with it a little the um, decline though in the share price was immediately after the US election when all tech stocks uh, took a knock but as you can see it's it's stabilized somewhat since then the other big issues that uh, that have been weighing on Alphabet as well as uh, Facebook in this past quarter, um, in the past few weeks rather, is the whole fake news story. Um, it's perceived that the Trump administration is going to want these companies to be monitoring the news feeds that they allow people to access a lot more closely in future to take misleading news out of it, to police it more, that's going to mean more costs. Um, on the other hand, Alphabet is also, uh, through its Google uh, operation, uh, boxing a little bit with the uh, European Union antitrust regulations. So as these things um, surface again, there's uh, a few concerns amongst the investors. We've got to look past all of that, and uh, this is a fantastic fantastic business. It's got the ideal business model. Uh, it generates or controls 95% of mobile search and uh, about 78% of search functions on desktops and laptops. And it just has the best product and it keeps investing in this product. Um, and as a consequence of that, the revenues grow uh, directly from a direct proportion. So Alphabet has had its uh, ups and downs. And I think someone like Jessica, who hasn't invested in the portfolio yet, will be very comfortable to be able to get into this stock at a level which is uh, quite a discount on where it was just a month or so ago. Our favorite share, um, for pretty obvious reasons, uh, when you show a 200% appreciation in RAND terms over two years, is Amazon. Um, but also, when you understand the business model of Amazon, there really is nothing that uh, is like it around the world. There's no there's no reason that I can see why you would start selling Amazon shares given that the company has a, a highly disruptive business model which is just taking hold all the time. It's mushrooming. It's like if you've got a really good product and it is a lot cheaper than what everybody else is offering and a lot more convenient and it gives you greater choice, well, why wouldn't you go with it? And if you live in a geography like we do in the UK, where you are exposed to the benefits of Amazon 
you can order something and literally have it in your home tomorrow and indeed if you're one of the 70 million people who have signed up for Amazon Prime which is a, a lovely subscription model uh, type income that comes into the Amazon fold well if you're in one of them you don't even pay for delivery Amazon's also uh, winning because it's web uh, it's it's uh, what Amazon Web Services is called. It's uh, investment in cloud computing was so far ahead of the game that it's making massive margins there and has a huge stake of that sector. So there's no reason whatsoever to reconsider Amazon's share um, as as a as a core holding of our portfolio. And as you can see, if you'd been smart uh, or lucky and bought in earlier uh, in the last couple of weeks after the Trump election and uh, the, the view that this was going to affect, or Mr. Market's view that this was going to affect all the tech stocks, well, you could have got it uh, quite a bit cheaper than the share price that it's at at the moment. Stu? Now, just on um, Amazon, Alec, Mark asks, considering it's done so well, aren't the best gains behind us? Is it not too late to invest in an Amazon, or is it going to be a long-term winner? Mark, our investment in Amazon was done on the strength of its business model, and if anything, I would look at Amazon's business model as getting stronger and stronger. So uh, it's a long-term winner. I, I, I would urge you, if you have any doubts, go and read the Berkshire Hathaway or the transcript of the Berkshire Hathaway AGM um, last year with this man who's on your screen now, Warren Buffett, and what he had to talk, say about the Amazonization of the world. And um, essentially, he was he, he mentioned Amazon maybe five or six times. Buffett doesn't invest in companies where he can't see the long-term or five to ten-year horizon on their profits. That's just the way he is. He's 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 a highly conservative investor. But the way that he was talking about Amazon, um, it it reinforces to me that their business model is something that is not just here to stay, but it continues to expand. So definitely not. Um, Amazon is still a stock that you can be accumulating very, very confidently. Stuart? Just off the back of that, Alec, um, what other indices would you consider, for example, the FTSE, which might benefit from political changes in the US? Would you consider something like that? You know, again, uh, again, to, to go back to um, Warren Buffett's uh, advice on these issues, the big picture is so hard to call. The big trends are impossible in fact on a day-to-day -day basis if you try and play the market by finding a uh, making a bet on something you are almost certainly going to have more losers than winners um, if you're lucky maybe a few more winners than losers but that's not investing that is speculating that's uh, rather go and have your bet on a on a horse um, in the in the Durban July or um, have a bet on a soccer match because here we're talking about investing. We're talking about taking a view on the company. It's like buying a business. When you invest into these companies, into these shares, you're buying the business, not all of it, but a very small slice of it, of course, but you, you buy a business not for what you can make in the next 10 minutes, but what you might make in the next 10 years. And that's why in 10 years time so much can have changed we have to look at the underlying portfolio um, of companies that are within a particular holding company where how is the company structured how is it run how is it governed are these honest people are they smart are they making the the right kind of decisions that you would expect if they were managers working for you and that's really where it all comes down to and Berkshire Hathaway is a very very good example of this if you have a look at the share price in some detail here, you'll see that it was bouncing around the mid-120s um, in the beginning of this year. And if you were taking a trading type approach at that stage, because we paid much more to buy our Berkshire Hathaway stake, you would be saying, oh, surely we should be switching into something better and finding a better opportunity. Well, as you can see, the share price is now almost $160 a share, and the big increase came with a 5% lift in the stock immediately after Trump was elected. Now, Buffett has been arguing, uh, as you are probably very well aware, for Hillary Clinton as being a better president than Donald Trump. In fact, if you go and listen to that same 
um, podcast of uh, or recording of the Berkshire Hathaway AGM or go and read through the transcript and saw on Biz News, you'll hear that he, he was asked by somebody uh, what happens if Donald Trump gets elected as president and his view on that is the same thing that I would say uh, as an answer to Marx and that is if you invest for the long term you'll outlive Donald Trump's presidency, you'll outlive the impact of Brexit, uh, you you probably outlive even if Boris Johnson were to become a prime minister in South Africa, <laughs> I'm sorry, in, in, in um, in the UK. Uh, I don't know if you can outlive the impact of a Jacob Zuma in South Africa because that's really a structural change to the economy there and we've seen the impact of that in the, on the South African rand. But in, in developed economies it's very difficult to call the big trends and it's also a much smarter idea to invest where people can operate within their circle of competence. And now just looking at that movement on Berkshire Hathaway as we're talking about it, that lift after the election of Trump was on the basis of the rotation of uh, investors into financials because, as mentioned earlier, uh, they believe banks are going to start lending again. Berkshire has got a $100 billion portfolio and it's concentrated in five stocks. Three of those stocks are banks, but Wells Fargo, um, Bank of America and well, financial services companies, uh, American Express, three of their big five. So clearly the portfolio is lifted by the fact that shares uh, in financial services are doing better. But secondly, higher interest rates will help Berkshire Hathaway, which is sitting on $68 billion in cash. Why do we talk higher interest rates? Well, we do know that the Fed has telegraphed that it's going to raise interest rates at the December meeting, so that's the first thing. But secondly, as Donald Trump starts spending more money uh, almost like Reaganomics type of approach, um, the, the immediate result of that is that you need higher interest rates because as inflation starts picking up again, uh, you need inf interest rates to reflect that. So that's the second point. And the other bull point is that his view is infrastructure needs to, uh, the new president is going to be betting on infrastructure in the United States and Berkshire Hathaway is extremely well positioned to take advantage of an infrastructure boom there, not least with BNSF, which is its uh, the biggest railroad company in the U.S., which Berkshire owns. Of course, Mid American is the um, uh, the biggest power or one of the biggest power producers. They're the biggest in renewable energy power producing, but they're the biggest, they're one of the biggest power producers, and they will also benefit from a lift. So Berkshire Hathaway, after doing really badly in the beginning of this year at share price and then lifting up and bouncing around a little um, came out with its third quarter profit numbers which were pleasing and as a consequence of that and the other factors that I've just mentioned there you see the lift in the share price and this by the way is one of our anchors it's almost like you have an S&P 500 index um, to reflect the market overall Berkshire's a bit like that uh, to reflect the US economy so it's a bit on the US economy. Stuart? So going back to Amazon, JB just wants to know how do you place a value on it, given the he says given the sporadic nature of its profits and free cash flow. It's one of those things that when you do your intrinsic value calculation on Amazon, most of the time what I do with South African stocks, the intrinsic value, I will take a five-year time horizon. So just very very quickly how intrinsic value works, you need to put a valuation on a on, on a company before you buy it. And the way you would do that is you would take the cash because a company is only worth the cash that it can generate. So the cash between today and Judgment Day, as uh, Buffett puts it. Well, you don't know when Judgment Day is going to be, but really if you want to be conservative, you can, for most uh, developed stocks, developed market stocks, and uh, I would use US and UK stocks like this, you take a 10-year horizon and then you work out what you think the company is going to, you take its current cash flows, free cash flows, because that's the money that it could reinvest in the business or distribute via um, dividends. You take its free cash flows and you then accumulate them over the next 10 years. You add that back to the current cash pile and that gives you a figure, divide that by the number of shares. I hope that's that's that helps a little bit. What I do in South Africa is I will only work to five years because it's a far more volatile market and I want better value um, in a volatile environment. But internationally, you, you, 
you, you um, put the potential growth. Now, when you start putting the kind of growth rates that we're seeing on Google, on Facebook, on Amazon, that intrinsic value, because of the compounded effect, starts going off the charts. And it's very hard to believe the numbers because they're so high. I just want to, when, when I put that into my cal 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 calculation, that I see a price north of $800 for Amazon if I'm putting in a 50% um, annualized growth on this company over the next 10 years. And I've got a very comfortably north of $800 um, valuation on it. That's where we start, we, 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 we battle when it comes to the exponential growth or exponential companies like those that I've just mentioned. Facebook is another one as well. Facebook's numbers, for instance, their revenues were up 56%, but their profits were trebled in the past quarter. Now, when you, when you put that into your spreadsheet, into your uh, exponential uh, calcu the, the calculations, it's, you, you, you start getting terribly confused because the numbers just look ridiculously high. But that's what happens with exponential companies. If you'd gone back, for instance, with Nuspass, which is a South African company that most people know, and look uh, at the appreciation and, and shake their heads, well, had you done the numbers for Nuspass based on the 30 to 50 percent of growth that has been coming out of its biggest shareholding, which is in Tencent in China, you would have looked at that and said, but that's far too high. It cannot get to that level. We as human beings cannot get our heads around exponentiality. It's just part of our makeup. It, we're hardwired to see things in a linear basis. Once we start uh, embracing what exponentiality is, what these kind of appreciations can actually do, like a Capitec. Think of Capitec over, what, the 20 years, growing at its profits by 50% a year compound, or PSG. If you went back 10 years ago and looked at the share price, you would have said it's ridiculously expensive. Now, the point is, how much longer can Amazon continue to grow at its current growth rates? My bet is at least 10 years. And if, if that's the way I feel, I can put those numbers into, um, into my, my, my calculation of intrinsic value and come out at the end with an intrinsic value for Amazon, which is far north of where the current share price is. But of course, it needs to continue to grow like that, and when it starts going X growth, which is what you saw with Apple. That's a very good example. If you look at the way that Apple was growing when the iPhones were surging ahead, the calculations that people had for its intrinsic growth, uh, or rather for its exponential growth, set the share price to far higher uh, than the current levels. What happened then was that as it started going X growth, as it, as it became clear that you're not going to sell more iPhones than there are people on the planet, or indeed you're only going to sell a percentage of the people on the planet, then the exponential growth rates of Apple started coming, uh, becoming less of a factor. And to me, what the big thing for Apple is, it's just generating cash, just what it's got now. It's throwing off enormous amounts of cash. It's got lots of cash in the balance sheet. And when you start adding all of this together, also, the growth that you're seeing for Apple in its services business. Now, just think of this for a minute. If you take the installed base of Apple um, iPhones, I mean, they, they, in, the, in the September quarter, they sold 45 million. They got a billion product, a billion devices in the marketplace. Now, those billion, as an, as an Apple fan for 30 years, I know that if I have one piece of Apple equipment, I love to have another piece of Apple equipment because they talk to each other. And then if I'm going to buy an app, I usually go to the Apple store to buy the app from it because I know that it works on my Apple computers and so on and so forth. And that was the genius of Steve Jobs. He created this ecosystem of Apple products which makes Apple fans, like myself, go back to the Apple store to buy Apple products rather than to maybe get the alternative that, uh, that a company like Google is producing. So the way I see Apple and why it's showing excellent value for me is that it has, it's throwing off a lot of cash and it has got a wonderful, um, wonderfully strong balance sheet. The other benefit, and you can see from the share price, it's fallen since the US election. 
I'm not so sure that that is the right reading by Mr. Market. Trump has said he's going to make it easy for U.S. companies to bring their cash back home. Up to this point, a company like Apple, which has got literally hundreds of billions of dollars sitting outside of the country, hasn't been, hasn't been able to bring that money back into the U.S. because of the taxes that it would have to pay when it repatriates that cash. Once Mr. Market realizes that Trump is real in what he's saying about these things, and if he abolishes that repatriation tax, it will give Apple a opportunity to consolidate all of its cash holdings in the United States and perhaps accelerate its investments into new fields where it believes it can have an advantage as well. The Apple car, as an example, uh, or driverless cars. So this is a company that is, has got an ecosystem of a billion devices. It's highly innovative. It continues to, to offer the installed base new ways of spending money with it, and it keeps bringing out new products like the Apple, the iPhone 7, uh, so the real fans can continue to upgrading. But its real value, I would, I would argue, is the install base, the ecosystem that already exists, and that was what Steve Jobs built over those years. That's what he understood, and uh, that also gives you the, the reason why we wouldn't dream of selling Apple shares at the moment. On to IBM, which is another one of our holdings here. IBM is a is a company that uh, nice to see that its share price is now finally broken up above that moving average line. The technical analysts will tell you that's a good thing. It's a company that is now starting to perform quite well for our portfolio, but for a long time um, it was our value bet. Again, when you use the intrinsic value, uh, the, the best way to invest is to work out a valuation for a share, then put in, so that's your intrinsic value, then put in your margin of safety. So I like to work at 15% at least below that. So let's just say with IBM we worked out its intrinsic value was $200 a share. We use a margin of safety of 15% uh, there, that would bring it down to $170 a share, which means you can buy the stock up to $170 comfortably. Well, as it happens, IBM's intrinsic value, in our opinion, or in my opinion anyway, is uh, comfortably north of $200 a share. And we're in good company here because it has been the biggest purchase that Warren Buffett has been making uh, in the past few years. Every year he's been, he's been continuing to add to his IBM shareholding to the extent that it is now one of those big five shares that he holds in his portfolio. Remember I mentioned Wells Fargo, Amer uh, American Express, Bank of America, uh, RBM and Coca-Cola are the other two. We don't have Coca-Cola, it was just a little bit out of our range, a bit too expensive uh, relative to intrinsic value, but RBM is one that we have been adding to the portfolio and you can too. Stuart? I like a question from Andrew. Andrew. He asks, would you, ask, you look at, would you look at Alibaba? Alibaba. Alibaba. So Say that again, you broke up a bit. A question from Andrew. Would you look at Chinese companies like Baidu or Alibaba? Uh, I would definitely, and I think the whole idea of the um, global portfolio is to look right around the world. My problem is I don't know them well enough. Both Baidu and Alibaba and of course uh, Tencent, sorry those two plus Tencent have been fantastic performers. I just don't understand them. And I think the most important thing when you are investing is first of all work within your circle of competence. I'm very comfortable with the stocks that we hold in the portfolio. I understand the companies, I understand uh, the the revenue generators and I've got a pretty good feel on the culture, on what's likely to, to uh, impact them and I can also see when the flags are being waved. I really don't know when it comes to the Chinese companies. It's just such a complicated geopolitical system there um, from time to time you have uh, attacks on Chinese entrepreneurship. On the other hand, at the moment it appears as though Chinese entrepreneurs are being celebrated in China and uh, hence you've got uh, Pony Ma from Tencent and Jack Ma from um, Alibaba being celebrated as great entrepreneurs, which of course they are. But if, if um, uh, President Xi were to take a different approach or pushed into a different approach or if some big business guy were 
unmasked as a as a corrupt individual and it is part of the whole corruption policy. My problem of investing in, in autocracies or, or, or countries that are run by people who have clear political motives where the public has no say. I mean, China, you don't have a vote. You know, China, you don't have a free media. Though that means that what is the information we're getting out of China? Is it, is it accurate? Um, can we trust it? If it is, then it'll be the only authoritarian regime on earth in history which has actually not used so-called official statistics to give you a picture that they wanted to give you. I'm just not close enough to it, uh, Andrew, so I do apologize. At this point in time, probably stick with what you know. Uh, investing is, is also, it's a lot about governance, it's a lot about transparency, it's uh, also about working within your circle of competence. And all of those things for me right now are, um, when I have a look at US and UK stocks, I feel very comfortable with them, and South African shares as well. Although I suppose the argument there is, what about NASPERS? Because they're invested in China in Tencent. Well, you've got to believe that if the investment in Tencent is that big, it's bigger than the whole NASPERS market cap from time to time, then they know what they're doing there and they'll be following that very closely and let them rather do the bets rather than trying to go in yourself where you might be caught short. Okay, on to our um, third but last stock here, and this is Barclays. Very excited uh, to see that Barclays has finally started lifting up its head. Uh, it was one of those investments that we didn't time very well. Uh, in fact, we bought it in April. Uh, then the, the share price looked like it was going to go up nice. In fact, had a had a good little run. And then it uh, came down um, uh, with a bump after Brexit. Reason for that was we paid pounds and the pound took a hiding and the US, uh, the UK banks got under, uh, were, were sold off very sharply after Brexit on concerns that the uh, that, that the leaving the European Union was going to affect them most. It's another reflection of the way that you should invest. If you if you look, in, the basic reason for buying Barclays PLC is there's a change in management. They've got a high street uh, franchise in the UK. As much as I love Metro Bank, and I do believe that Metro Bank will be another Capitec in this market. Only 1% of Brits change their bank accounts every year, 1%. Now that's plenty for Metro Bank to, um, to feed off, but when you're a Barclays, even if you're a bad bank, and they aren't in the high street, as I, I mentioned earlier, they, they really are getting their act together. But even if you were a bad bank, you still would be taking a long time before your high street franchise would be uh, affected. The irony of this is that the uptick in the share price over the past month has been on Donald Trump's election and on Barclays' insistence on retaining its investment banking function and its American operations. So there was a time that many investors discounted the investment banking and U.S. operations out of Barclays, and certainly we did when we bought it, because we bought it at about 0.6 times book value. What you're saying there is that if you liquidated the company today, you'd get 40% more than the current share price just by liquidating it. So it had got to the stage when we were bought in in April where Barclays was just frighteningly cheap. Now it's starting to come back into favor um, for reasons that we could never have interpreted or forecast. And that's what you do when you buy cheap, you buy good value operations. Barclays' real story, though, is it was very, uh, it offered excellent value if they could fix it. Uh, Slaney, the new chief executive, and McFarlane, the new chairman, uh, are taking a bit longer than the market thought they would, but they are making the right decisions. Clearly, when you walk around Barclays banks in the high street here in the UK, you will see a rejuvenated approach. Now, I don't know if that's a short term thing, but it certainly is a big contrast to what you see at most other high, uh, high street banks. And secondly, they've had a lovely uh, fillip from what's going on in the United States. The decision to sell out of ABSA um, is one that was criticized at the time, 
but it does appear from a long-term perspective that it is going to be far better for Barclays to have those rands converted into pounds um, in the UK, which they can then deploy here, than to uh, continue in a, a very uh, turbulent environment. So they're making the company a lot smaller, a lot easier to manage, and uh, they are enjoying the benefits thereof. We are coming to the end of our presentation for today. Uh, Facebook, as I say, we don't spend too much time uh, analyzing the stocks that we are busy adding to our portfolio. Of course, we spoke a lot about Facebook last month, but this is a stock that we've been watching for a long, long time and uh, very happy to have made the decision finally to invest in Facebook. And it's really good to be able to buy in now at just over $120. Of course, we bought in um, significantly higher than that last month, but that's fine. That's why you stagger your purchases into in, into shares. They came out with the quarterly results on the 2nd of November, um, and that was um, well ahead of markets expectations. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the net income there went from $900 million to $2.4 billion. So not quite three times, but and that's $900 million in the same quarter a year before on revenues which were up 56%. So what is that telling you? It tells you that as the revenues grow, you've got this crocodile effect that the margins just grow as well because you have fixed costs at, at Facebook and they have the wonderful exponential model, a model where scale is everything. They reach, would you believe, 1.79 billion active users. Now there's 7 billion people on the planet and lots of those are little, young people, and lots of those are very old. But pretty much a big, well, a huge percentage of those in between have got a Facebook account. Incredible. Incredible. That's up 16% year on year, incidentally, the, uh, the number of active users. They have uh, a big share of mobile advertising and um, they're doubling down on video. The big story for Facebook going ahead is that they are wanting to in attack the $70 billion a year in television advertising and they believe that they can get a big chunk of that. Remember, Facebook's net incomes uh, are still running at only about $10 billion a year. So, and that's from the existing advertising. But if they can attack that $70 billion in, in uh, U.S. advertising revenue and pull a bit of that across, you can easily double their revenues. And Facebook being a fixed cost with scale adding to the bottom line um, is just in a magnificent position. So very happy to be holding that one in the portfolio. And then Tesla, it was a big month for Tesla. Sorry? Got you Sorry, still? Andrew wants to, Andrew Andrew wants to buy, 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 buy. No, you broke up a bit? Um, so it's from hands. So from Alec. 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 I think I've got a bit of feedback, so my, my question might not come through properly. He asks, why did you buy FB now instead of earlier? Facebook, sorry, that is. Facebook. Well, the, the, the um, we've been looking at Facebook for a while, and it was always expensive. It always seemed relative to the uh, the, the the valuation uh, that I could see in it. In other words, in the growth that I was anticipating from Facebook, it always looked like you were going to overpay. And I was, uh, to be frank, I was waiting for a pullback in the share price. Missed out in January this year, um, as you can see from the graph, which we've got back up on the screen. It came back really nicely in January for nicely for as far as uh, purchases are concerned. And you could have got it uh, under $100. Um, but it then didn't, didn't last very long. Early February, bounced up again after good quarterly results. And since then, it has been continuing to rise. Part of the reason for Facebook was also that, um, and, and we say this with the portfolio, when we find one of the shares in the portfolio that no longer appeals, um, we will look for alternatives that we've been examining and keeping our eye on. And when we just took the decision to sell Novo Nordisk, it was an ideal opportunity to go into two stocks that we felt were, were offering value, and Facebook um, is one of those. So that was, Andrew, that was the reason. I'm sorry I didn't buy it earlier, but um, I guess that rather late than never, and in, certainly in that, uh, in that party, that party is going to be going on for a long, long time, but like Amazon, I think. And then uh, our final stock in the portfolio is Tesla. Now, we've got a small stake here. We are 
buying these very slowly and the reason why we're accumulating them now rather than having done so before is because the valuation of the share is now starting to look very attractive. The opportunity arose to buy these shares at these levels because of the deal that Tesla has done with uh, Solar City. You have to understand the background to see why did Tesla do this deal. Tesla, uh, it, it, it might surprise you, uh, although it was referred to as a merger with Solar City, it really was anything but. Uh, Tesla is by far the senior partner. Uh, if you take the valuation of Tesla and Solar City, Tesla was 93.5% and Solar City 6.5% of the uh, combined lot. And yet Wall Street are un, uh, was very upset about this. Uh, they still are uh, affecting Tesla or hurting Tesla as a consequence. There was a, uh, a report, in fact, put out this week by uh, Morgan Stanley to say that there's an absolutely no value to this deal. Well, that's their opinion. If you understand that Elon Musk and uh, his brother Kimball uh, who both involved in the whole Tesla SpaceX operation, grew up as uh, kids with the uh, Reeve brothers, uh, Lyndon and uh, Peter, who run Solar City. If you realize that they holiday together, they actually go out at n uh, on social occasions together, they are the closest of friends, these South Africans who've left Pretoria and are living in Silicon Valley. They, they're clearly highly intelligent, highly entrepreneurial. In fact, they made it into the Pretoria news as teenagers when these guys went off and um, bought or, or got themselves set up to have a video arcade. Uh, but because none of them were over 18, they weren't able to sign the lease on the premises that they'd uh, secured. And, and their parents weren't prepared at that stage to sign the leases either. So the newspaper got hold of the story and was uh, talking about these young entrepreneurs. Well, if only we could have invested in them at that point. But the deal, the, the, the business rationale of the merger between Tesla and Solar City is that they are both having to bet very heavily on batteries. Now, Tesla has got uh, the Gigafactory, which is building batteries in, uh, in the middle of the desert. Um, and Solar City, which is the biggest installer of solar power in the United States, needs to have a storage system because solar power, can you imagine the value that it's going to have when you've got a cheap battery system that you can actually run your through the day, you can you, you use the solar and it builds up so that you don't have to go onto the grid and use coal, uh, heaven help us, nuclear or any of the other grid sold um, power sources. What we're seeing in renewables is that the costs are continuing to decline. There have been subsidies that the government have uh, given to renewable companies, and Solar City was a threat um, from a political perspective because, of course, Donald Trump doesn't believe in there's any such thing as global warming. So, from his perspective and those who support him, they seem quite happy to continue to push out coal into the atmosphere, how uh, misguided that is, they will hopefully discover one day. But the reality is there's been enough support of getting to get Moore's law going in renewable energy for, for an operation like SolarCity and uh, now Tesla, which, is, which uh, has absorbed it, to really benefit from the retail or, or the, the, the rolling out of nuclear uh, of, uh, solar power to the American public. It was a fantastic deal when you have a look at it from Elon Musk's perspective. He gets his cousins to work with him. He can overcome as the biggest shareholder in, in Solar City. He can help Solar City to overcome a lot of those um, problems that you have when you start manufacturing. Solar City is only now starting to manufacture. They can get together and do their, their batteries at the in a combined effort. There are many, many uh, reasons why it makes sense. But for Wall Street, it was looking presumably at the short-term benefits. Uh, they couldn't see the, 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 the uh, sense of all of this. And as a consequence, the share price has been under some pressure. We're very happy if you've ever looked or seen a Tesla a car, um, and, and you'll understand when Musk says he built a computer 
with a vehicle around it. He's got a huge advantage in the whole electric vehicle, um, or certainly a luxury electric vehicle sector, which will grow and grow into the future. Um, and Tesla is extremely well positioned. They, they're continuing to now beat uh, estimates from the market. So this was the time to make the investment. We've done so. Um, we think it's still a very good time to be adding to the portfolio, and we bought more of those shares in the past month. Here's the portfolio just to close off with that uh, you can see how we are structured. Around 10% is sitting in the S&P 500 index. As we did in this past month, when we find a suitable investment to go into, we sell from the S&P 500, um, which was always meant to be a little bit of a, a place to, to uh, leave money, a, a bit of a, uh, uh, almost like a bank on the side, um, so that we could then dip into that when we found a suitable investment. Well, we have through Metro Bank, but we've sold sufficient to buy Metro Bank shares that will take us to 8%. You'll see uh, from the, the whole outline of the portfolio right in the beginning was to try and have your share picks at 8% of the portfolio. Now, of course, um, with Amazon doing as well as it has, it's gone to 16% of the portfolio. We did put more into Alphabet and into Apple to give them a, a bigger weighting because we also think that they are um, fabulous long-term holdings. But we will be taking uh, Facebook and Metro uh, up to 8% each, and we will be taking Tesla up to 4% and maybe bumping a little bit more of the value is full exists in that stock. But overall, the portfolio, which started at just over 2 million rand uh, when we began it in December 2014, is now worth nearly 3.4 million rand. So it shows that that overall philosophy of diversifying out of rand investments was one that has worked out to the advantage of everybody who's followed this portfolio. Uh, as mentioned, the we, we were running an analyzed return last month at 29%. That's now picked up to 30%, primarily because the rand is weakened from 1379 to 1423 against the dollar and um, from around 1650 to 1760 uh, against the pound. So the rand still has a very, very significant impact on what happens on this portfolio uh, or to this portfolio on an ongoing basis. I know we've been a little longer than our usual um, uh, period, but. Uh, the, the thinking was to try and take you through the rationale for the investments that we've made so that if you are following um, the portfolio and particularly the new ones, you also have the confidence to be able to uh, follow us. Stuart, shall we uh, finish off with a question or two? Uh, yes, thanks, Alec. There's a question on dividends. How important are dividend yields when you assess stocks for the business portfolio? They, we don't look at dividend yields at all. Um, the reason for that is that if you do need to uh, generate income from your portfolio, there are lots of other ways of doing it rather than through dividends. What we would suggest is what Warren Buffett suggest, uh, um, recommends to the shareholders in Berkshire Hathaway. He says if you are going to live or if you have a portfolio, say that you, you think if you're 60 years old and you think a good time is you're going to live to you 90, well, you, you are pretty safe in selling a, that, that will give you 30 years, so if you take your portfolio, let's just say it's 100, you divide it by the 30 years, you're quite happy then to be selling off 3% of your portfolio or of your shareholding per year if you need to generate income in that way. So there are many ways of generating income from a portfolio. You can sell, as he says to his Berkshire shareholders, sell 3% of the shares that you hold in the company because Berkshire, of course, never pays dividend. And the feeling that he has and it's a, a belief that many other companies have as well, both Amazon and Alphabet falling into this category, and of course uh, so does Facebook and Tesla, is that the company itself will do far better by reinvesting the cash into the business than you would do by taking the cash and putting it into um, a, uh, an alternative investment, i.e. into the bank. But if you need the liquidity, sell some of the shares. That's it from Masa. Thanks, Alec. Thank you, Stuart. Thanks, everybody, for joining us today. It's been uh, uh, quite a lengthy uh, update.
update, and they aren't usually this long, but I'm sure that you uh, appreciate that it, it had to be this time, given uh, all the ground we had to cover. Um, we're very grateful that uh, we have a portfolio that has performed so well, but remember, the intention here is the long-term holding. The intention always has been, whatever we put into the portfolio, the average holding period is forever. Novo Nordisk uh, kind of caught us out a little bit there, but for the rest of them, you buy and hold. Until next time, cheerio.